what we do best. We got the recipe for success. We don't need sight to make something good tonight. We're all in the kitchen, gonna show you what we got. Welcome to the Cooking Without Looking TV show, Mother's Day edition for 2024. I'm your host, Alan Preston. My co-host, Annette Watkins, is off celebrating Mother's Day today. So we have an all-male cast uh, today. Where am I at? There we are. As we like to remind you that all of us here on our Cooking Without Looking TV show are blind or spiritually visually impaired. Our mission is to change the way we see blindness. That's hashtag change the way we see blindness. Now, let's start with an old friend of the show, Harry Rentmeesters from Belgium. Uh, you may have noticed a similarity to our executive producer's name, Renee Redmeester. Uh, Terry is her cousin. Welcome, Terry. Thank you. And what city are you in in Belgium? What? What city is it that you are in in Belgium? I'm Belgium. I live in Kortenberg. Short mountain. Ah, for you guys. And what's the weather like over there this evening? This evening is sunny for the first time. Still su sunny. And it's got to be getting kind of late over there, isn't it? It's uh, been raining until now. We got the first time a good weather yesterday. Ah, well. Uh... If I'm not mistaken, aren't you a classical trained chef? Yes, I'm a classical trained. But I learned the most uh, cooking from my mother. And would you tell us a little about your issue with blindness? Uh, I have been good seeing until I was 43. And then I got to go. I went to the hospital for an operation and they gave me the wrong medication and my nerve is burned down. So my left eye is totally quick away, away. And um, a little on the right side, I had a 30% and tunnel vision. So everything I see is in one big hole. Sort of like looking through a soda straw? Yeah. Wow. That is uh, really something. Um, yeah, but you got to learn to live with it, eh? Yeah. There's more in life than only this. Eh? Wow. <laughs> well, before we get to your recipe, which is uh, one of your mother's beef stew, yes. uh, tell us a little bit about your, what your mother was like. Uh, she been a, she was a housewife, and she was always there. A uh, little bit, uh, she was a very good cook, and her house householding was very important. She you have was, a lot of an uh, influence on your uh, cooking skills. Yeah, I don't know. She she just like she is a. Uh, now dead for over 10 years, but she was 93, so she did it well. 93? Yes. Wow. Yeah, indeed. indeed. Wow. My golly, that was, uh, that's quite a story. So you, you learned to cook through her and then you became a classically trained chef? Yeah, yeah, and I... I gave lesson to people who are also disabled. 
So there is nothing better than a disabled person who can teach another disabled person. Hmm, that's really something. So, Terry, it's time for you to show us how to prepare your mom's Belgian beef stew recipe. Okay, I'm going to start. So first we're going to cut the onions. I cut something up for it. And when I cut the onions, I always go with my fingers like a spider. That's for me a safe thing to do. I know that some of our audience is sighted and are able to see what you're doing. And that was a good description of how you uh, how you cut it for those who can't see what you're doing. And I always hold my knife against my fingers. So I never cut in my, my fingers. So I cut the onions in little pieces. You're chopping up that onion fairly fine, am I right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Now we're going to do some butter in the pot. What is it you're doing now? Now I turn on my fire. It's like three. So the numbers are digital. It's a blackboard with red uh, uh, yeah, um, red sign, red red under it. Okay. So I can always see which uh, degrees it are. Now we're going to do the buttering. That would uh, put the onions in it. Okay. But uh, on a slow fire, you're not going to do the onions thin and brown. No, no, just when they're a little bit ready. Just a, just a little play. Yeah. Keep stirring it. While that is happening, I can cut the beef. I already need this. And this is the beef. You can cut it in little pieces, almost like two centimeters by two centimeters. This is cooking. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, I think I've lost the picture here, Renee. Hmm. Uh, lost the picture. Terry is gone. Okay, just a second. Are you still able to hear us, Terry? Hey. Ah, there you are once again. <laughs> Don't be slow, is it? <laughs> okay, what is it you're doing here now? Is this butter? Yes. Not I well, cut some butter of it for the, the meat. So I'm going to turn the pan, put the fire on it, and uh, the meat, you just have to put it brown. Yeah. Wait a minute. I've lost it all together. Don't know what happened. And, uh, lost everything. With the meat, you're gonna the meat you're gonna season it with salt and pepper. <clears throat> so what are you doing now, Terry? <laughs> Looking for my fire. Okay, and you keep stirring it all the time? 
Now, now it, my brother is in Reliot. Now it begins. I can put the onion spirit. Yeah, I've, I've lost my video here, uh, so I have absolutely no idea what's going on that way. But Renee, I still oh. have my script. So Terry, you're going to have to kind of tell me what you're doing there. One might say I'm operating. Or uh, stirring the butter. Yeah. Now the butter is going a little bit yellow. How do you know when it's done? The, the stew? The oh, stew, what? Well, the, what you're cooking there, yes. Ah, okay. Uh, it took the moment you are ready with it, then you got to let it uh, slow. Heat, you got it uh, for approximately two to three hours on the fire without the lid. And this is one of my favorites because you can always uh, use some uh, gingerbread also. Okay, so you could use a variety of different meat in there, right? Yeah, I like it this way. It's a uh, bit sour. Made of pears. Uh, and you said it takes two to three hours? Yeah, yeah. Until the meat is in. Yeah, you don't want to be standing there cooking it constantly. And that's at a low flame. So yep. does it like. Yeah, here it's a little bit like it's simmering? Four to five here. This fire is going to tell, but I put it mostly on four to five. But you can't leave the, the lid off because the, the water is coming out. So it doesn't all evaporate. Yes, it keeps the good flavor in too, I bet. Yep. But you need to make I'll sure that, it's a minimal flavor. And I imagine that. you do have to stir it occasionally, correct? Yeah. This is for the onions to stew it up. Okay. The cream. Oh. Now we can do the meat also. So just burn it All right. um, just until it's yellow, brown, eh? golden. And then we're going to put it by the onions. As I turn the uh, meat in the pan, I always do this piece by piece because otherwise the pan is going cold. If you put it all together there, the pan is directly cooling off. And now we're going to put the meat in it. We're going to season it with pepper and salt. Well, this is salt. It's going to take a little bit. Like a teaspoon. Pepper, I use black pepper. I like black pepper. I like black pepper too. I, I, it's a good spice. Yeah. I, I like know. to find my own pepper. I find the taste of it much more better than the white. Yeah, I think so too. So here is here again. This is almost ready. So what is it you're doing there now? Uh, lower the fire. Okay, you can tell by the sound or by the smell. Okay. 
How am I gonna put it on uh, six? And by the time this is cooked for over two hours, everything in there is completely cooked, the meat and all, correct? Yeah, yeah, and the flavors are all together. My opinion is today, after, it's much better. Sort of like chili. But this is much of food this way. The day after, much better than this. When everything has a chance to kind of marinate together. Yeah, I agree. A lot of foods like that taste better the next day. Well. So what else have you added to that now? Now, I use the other fryer now for the meat. Okay. Just had to get some golden brown look. Then I'm going to get the meat with the onions together. Oh, I bet that smells good, too. Yeah. That's what they going to find, eh? the TV that smells. So that's the first meat. When it's done and you set it on fire, on a low fire, you can also put it in the oven. But then you get to put the lid on the top. And in the oven, it's, it's two hours. 150 degrees uh, in America it's almost 300 Fahrenheit I think so this is done wow Terry that, that's uh that's really great. I'm going to put the meat in this dish. I'm going to put the other meat here. That's the last one. I'll bet a nice piece of homemade bread with butter on it would really go good with that. Here is butter. You can also, this is beef, but you can all also use uh, veal. This is the version you got to use. So, this one you got to taste as well, for. And salt. And again, pepper. What is it you're doing there now? What? I say, what is it you're doing there now? I season it. I season the meat. And I shake the bun. This one, this is beer, it's a Belgian beer, 12 degrees. I don't know if you got there in America, this kind of beer. This is, uh, I don't know if you see it. St. Bernardisch called. That's a dark beer, strong, but it's very aromatic. A dark beer, okay. Yeah. Now we're gonna put the meat here in. What? Gonna steer it. So next, we 
each side. So use two teaspoons of thyme. Now I'm a little bit curious, Terry. Uh, was the beer for the stew or was the beer for you? Uh, no, no, no. The beer is for uh, the stew. <laughs> what? And some uh, Laura and Hardy leaves. Tomorrow. It's going to be in the pot and two uh, gloves. I hope I'm saying it right. This is here we go with trout now. Oh, yeah. A little steering. Now, we're going to declass the pan with the, the beer. Because a lot of aroma is in the pan. And with the beer, we're going to declass it. And we're going to put the beer with the pot, with the steel. I'm rearing at the bottom now for the season and then the taste of the meat. It's all come together. And when it's cooked a little bit, the beer, then we're going to put it with the stew. After that, I'm going to. Put two teaspoons, uh, two spoons of uh, sour in the stew. That's almost ready. Then. Well, Terry, that looks really amazing. It's, it's good, that's all. Yeah? It's, you do this all to taste or just from knowing what, what's got in there? Here in Belgium, you, you find in other, in the, in any chip shop. So you always find with mayonnaise and fries. I, today I'm doing it with uh, bread. You can eat it with fries, potatoes, or bread. I usually use uh, baguettes. Again, to cook. We got the steward on the bottom. So every taste of the seasoning and the, the meat is coming loose. Yeah. Now I'm gonna put it with the uh, stew. Uh, fire back on zero. Now these two, two, uh, two spoons of a syrup. This is a pear syrup. And also use uh, apples. Okay, that's interesting. The only thing I get to do now is uh, take the breath. Put some mustard on it and then wait. Uh, 
I usually uh, use brown bread. And this is Dijon. You know Dijon monster? Hold on. This is for the thickness of the sauce and also the flavors of the mustard in it. At the end, it's for the thickness of the sauce. You lay it with the mustard on the stew, not otherwise. Some of this stuff you can pre measure, is that right? Uh, the dry ingredients and things? Really? Yeah. Which? Well, they say some of the uh, some of your dry ingredients you could pre-measure, right? Yeah. Or you just kind of do it by taste. Uh, at the end you gotta season it all. Huh? You oh. gotta taste it. You gotta taste it, and then you can uh, you can season it. But this is also what I've done now. This is standard. At the end, you gotta taste it, and yeah, if you want some pepper or salt, you can do it. Mostly, you always add a little later. That's right. Yeah. So now you gotta do it. This is now done. You gotta let it burn, stew, and uh, after an hour, you're gonna stir it. Not now. After an hour, you lay the lid is off, so no lid on it. And after an you hour, have to you let it cook it. for another couple of hours, right? Yeah, two to three hours now. In the oven, you have, uh, hours. some finished uh, a finished plate of stew that you could show us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I got the stew already done. I had a feeling you did. <laughs> <laughs> so I got it to show. Oh, by golly, on a cold winter's day, that is really good. I don't know that you can see it, but this is the stew. Nice homemade bread. A little further up, Terry. Yes? Little, yeah, to your chest, to your chest, and people will see. Um, Hold it up towards your chest a little bit. Yeah, a little more, a little more, a little more. Yep, there you go, perfect. Ooh, that looks good, doesn't it, Alan and Chad? Oh, I bet that's going to be that's one of awesome. <laughs> I keep waiting for smell-o-vision, Renee. <laughs> I know. You've been saying that for a while, Alan. We have to develop smell-o-vision. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed, indeed. Because here in Belgium, also, there are a lot of cooking programs. You can smell it, huh? Terry, thank you so much. That was my right part. Here, all the way from Belgium. Yes. With your mom's Belgian beef stew. It sounds amazing. Another thing, Alan, here is the middle point, middle point of Belgium, where I live. Kurtenberg is, is the middle point of Belgium. Thank you. That's nothing. Thank you very much, Terry. That was great. Enjoy it. And uh, let's go now to chat. <laughs> let's see what he is. All right. All right. Thank, thank you very much, Terry. And now. We have Chad Bartlett from, from Fort Myers, Florida, if I'm correct. Welcome, Chad. That is correct. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today, Alan. Chad, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your life with your blindness issue? Sure. Um, I was born uh, legally blind. Um, I had about 2200 vision. I was able to read print. Um, I used bifocals. I had to hold a very close, large print. 
Um, as I've aged, my vision has deteriorated and I've lost some color perception um, that continues uh, to, to diminish. Um, my eye condition is called congenital optic atrophy. It was determined to be a birth defect. My uh, optic nerve, uh, nerve endings are underdeveloped and that's what transmits the message from uh, your eyes uh, to your brains. And that's where some of the message gets lost. Um, at present, I'm, I'm minimally able to read anything in print, but rely heavily on all my Apple devices and the voiceover accessibility technology that's built right into it to be able to allow me to navigate apps, do email, text, all the other things I do. A um, couple things I'm doing lately that I really enjoy. Um, I started teaching aqua aerobics to everybody in my condo complex a couple weeks back when our lady went back north for uh, the summer. Uh, so I'm having a lot of fun doing that. And I also joined a board of directors recently for a nonprofit called See the World Education. Uh, we are currently planning a big um, gala for November of this year, a uh, new fundraising event for us. So I'm trying to um, nail down a venue uh, and get some progress there. So lots going on, but I am indeed retired due to disability. Uh, probably in my early 30s, a secondary disability began to emerge, uh, a movement disorder. So currently I use a wheelchair or a walker, uh, depending upon how far I'm going. I'm heading over to the pool. It's about a quarter mile away. That gets me in my wheelchair. But I can navigate my condo all right, and I really enjoy cooking. Is is the is that issue related to your eyes in some way? No, uh, there is not likely any connection there between them. Uh, the secondary condition, they can't tell me what it is. All I can hear is what it isn't. But that's okay. I just got to play the cards you dealt and make the best of it. If I was... If I didn't have this vision problem and my movement disorder, I'd still be working today. So you got to look at the good side. Take stock in what you got. Isn't technology That's wonderful? Well, I'm sorry. I missed that. Now, I know you're going to prepare a whole Mother's Day brunch for your mom. So right. tell us a little bit about your mother. Sure. Uh, Mom is wonderful, but I'm sure that's what everybody says about their mother. Um, I'm really fortunate. Uh, I've got to take some cross-country trips that'll be memorable. And mom treated me just like any other kid who didn't have a vision problem. I rode a skateboard. I rode a bike. I was mainstreamed in school. Um, did all the normal things. Um, you know, there weren't any uh, anything that made me feel odd or different, which was really good. That mainstream, that was good. And I did go to college. I went to University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. I got a bachelor's degree uh, in communications. And after that, I worked for four different Fortune 500 companies throughout my career. I'm very proud of that. I worked for some wonderful places and made some progress. University of Wisconsin. I went to the University of Minnesota. Is that right? Yeah, how do we both end up down here in Florida? Good decisions, I'm sure. Uh, smart if you've lived through the winters up there. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Not missing that at all. In fact, if I could say hi to a buddy of mine back in Wisconsin, Marius is the only guy I know who listened to my previous podcast with Renee twice. So hi to Marius back in Wisconsin. I'm pretty sure Marius is eight years old. All right. All right, Chad, it's time to show us what you're preparing for your mother this Mother's Day. Great. Today, as I understand it, you're preparing a breakfast uh, scramble. And Correct. then afterwards, you'll have to tell us what you're going to include for lunch. Sure. Um, so I got my pan on already, and I've got my uh, red front burner on. The dial is pointed straight down, which I know is medium. It's going to be the perfect temperature to cook this all the way through. You won't have to adjust at all. So the first thing I'm going to do is add a little avocado oil to my pan. Uh, avocado oil is my preferred oil for a higher smoke point, and it's also um, healthy, very healthy. So I would say ballpark you use about two tablespoons. I just kind of three pour. Take a look. 
Next thing we're going to do is shake that around with the pan, make sure it covers all over the bottom. And after that, we're going to start by adding our julienne potatoes. So what I did is I got a lot of my ingredients already together, uh, sort of prep and shorten up the time frame for cooking today. So the first thing I have here are three baby red potatoes that I used a veggie chopper on. I'm hoping that's visible. Yes, I like those choppers. I have one myself. So let me throw those potatoes in and get those started. And then I'm going to show you how that veggie chopper works because it is an incredible time saver. You can hear those potatoes start to sizzle as soon as they hit the pan. We're going to spread those around and let those sit for about five minutes and hopefully start to get them browned up a little bit. So as those are going, let me show you this veggie chopper. I think it's about 20 bucks. You can get them anywhere. So this part comes with a lid. This is where all your veggies are going to be stored once you push them through. This just rests on the top. It doesn't snap into place. And then what you can do is you open this lid and you place your veggies right over the grate, which oh. comes out easily. There's three different sizes of grates too. This is the largest one I used today for my mushrooms. If there's two smaller sizes, you can make julienne or whatever size you think is what you're trying to accomplish. Once your veggie's in there, you just push down, slam it shut, comes out the other side. I love the time-saving capability of this device. Here is oh, another one of the greats I've got handy. It's a much smaller, this is the julienne size that I used for the potatoes today. Pretty cool. It's a little different than the one I have, but that's pretty cool. Uh, it just makes a short work of your stuff instead of all that chopping and dicing that can be so timely. And if you nick a finger, well, that ruins your day. Yes, so, it does save on the fingers, especially for people who may be a little concerned about using a knife if they're newly blind or something, right? Safety first. Absolutely. So here's what I have, our sausage patties. These are pre-cooked rounds. You can buy them in your freezer section. Big time saver. I pulled these out, I cut them up into little pieces. I'm gonna throw this in next with my potatoes. Let's go back, take a stir, see how everything's doing. You said you're using pre-cooked sausage, is that right? Yeah, the sausage is already done, so I don't have to worry about any raw sausage or not being cooked enough. It's a really good tip to make it easy, save some time. And this is all in one pan today, which, which I really love if you don't like dishes. Yeah, I'm cleaning up is worse than the cooking part. I agree. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and add my sausage now to my potatoes. I'm lucky I got my sink right here too, so I can just toss my stuff in when I'm done. I'm going to give this a little bit more stir. You probably can hear it starting to sizzle and it's starting to smell good too. And I'm a lefty, so I apologize for standing right in front of it. All right, we're going to let that go for a little bit. I'm going to show you what else I've got here. Next, also through the veggie chopper were some mushrooms. That was the largest size. I'm going to add those in a second. Share an idea with you. So you can put about anything you want into this kind of a breakfast scramble, but be careful adding vegetables because they have so much water content. Peppers and onions taste great in there, but they're so wet, it's tough to end up with a nice dry scramble when you're done, which is really uh, what I like. Some, some folks don't enjoy moisture and eggs because it, it, it just turns them off. Good so, I'm gonna keep stirring here. Is this something you got to keep stirring all the time? Yeah, you got to keep it moving periodically. You don't want anything to burn on the bottom. Um, you know, you got a couple of minutes in between each time that you can go without stirring and not worry about anything getting too bad. But we're coming along nicely. So now I'm going to add my mushrooms. I've found that often if you listen carefully and can smell fairly good, uh, that you can keep track of how things are cooking too. Absolutely true. 
Use your nose and your ears. And that reminds me of something else. There's something called peak smell. If you really pay attention as you're cooking, you can tell when things are done by the way they smell. And it's something you may have to train or work on, but being visually impaired, that's something I've really gotten in tune with, whether it's, you know, fish or anything. If it's not a smell, maybe it's more of a texture when you flip it. Oh, and that brings me to one other really cool thing. Uh, where did it go? I'm going to show you my double spatula, which I think is in here somewhere. You know what? Uh, I'm not finding it, but I'm going to okay. describe it to you. So picture an ice tong or a salad, uh, salad, um, salad tongs. Instead of on the end, uh, like tongs, you would have two spatulas. And this thing is great for picking up delicate stuff like fish, burgers, anything you want to flip that you don't want to slap it back down because there might be some splash in your pan or whatever you're cooking on. It's a great way, especially if it's fish that's very delicate, you can break it, you can pick it up real nicely, hold it carefully and set it back down gently. That's a good idea, yes. Yeah. All right, everything's it coming together real nice here. Right. What I have in a measuring cup over here is four eggs that I've broken and whisked already. What I'm going to do next is throw those eggs into my pan slowly. I've got them in a, a two cup glass measuring cup, which really makes it nice and easy to pour because there's a spout. So that's what I love about it. Oh, and one other tip, I'm not sure how well you can tell on my counter here, but I have granite counters that are really busy. I just lay down a few sections of paper towel to put all my ingredients and stuff on, so I don't swat anything off the counter by mistake. Make a mess, spill something. It's a lot easier to see stuff when it's not so busy. So I'm going to show you trying to pour my eggs here. And again, you do this nice and slow from the center. Okay. Now we're only a couple of minutes away from being done. This is going pretty quick now. Once your eggs are in, it's going to set up relatively fast. I'm actually going to turn off my burner at this point. Do you have a gas or electric stove? It is electric. Do you have electric? Electric. All right, let's give a couple stirs, and it's a good time to add in a little pepper and salt. You can kind of do that to taste, right? Yep. Always if something you can smell, add a little later. It smell, if you could smell it, it's smelling great, Alan. Uh, I keep asking Renee about smell of vision uh, <laughs> So uh, one of my favorites is pink Himalayan sea salt. Uh, they're large granules, and I just like the flavor more than regular salt. So you got a little crushed ground pepper, a little bit of pink Himalayan sea salt. I'm going to give this a little stir, and we're almost done. All you need is mom. That's right. We'll have her on Sunday. I actually invited mom to come early on Sunday. I'm going to take her for a special water aerobics class on Sunday morning in the pool. And after that, we're going to do brunch. But wait a minute. This is for breakfast before you go to the class? No, no. After. Class is at 930. We'll have brunch after class. Oh, okay. You're going to make her work for it, huh? That's right. Burn your calories first, then you get breakfast. So I'm just kind of moving this around a little bit in my pan. You can see perhaps where the running eggs, so there's a um, light kind of glistens off them. Um, just kind of moving around a little as it's setting up. You want to make sure everything cooks thoroughly. Now's probably a good time I could add my cheese because it's almost done. Oh, a little cheese. Yeah, that sounds really good. What kind of cheese do you use? My preference is Mexican shredded cheese. Gives it a little extra flavor. I also like to throw blackened seasoning into it. That's not mom's favorite, but I really like it, so I won't do that for her on Sunday. But if this was mine, it would go in there. You can also finish this with a little salsa on the top, almost like a huevos rancheros. 
Now, I unfortunately spilled my cheese on the floor, so we won't be adding cheese, but that's okay. So here's what that looks like. Is, are you able to see that? Is that high enough? Looks great. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Now, I've got a finished plate that I'm going to show you as well here in the microwave. I have a cat, and he's notorious. Oh, Lord. My cat is notorious for surfing my counters and eating stuff. Yeah. Here's what we have for mom on Sunday. We have a banana, some blueberries, a couple pieces of buttered cinnamon toast, and a section of breakfast scramble. That sounds fantastic, Chad. We'll, we'll round that out with coffee and orange juice. I bet you're making a lot of mothers out there jealous right now. Well, you got to talk to your kid. He can do it, too. I just showed you how. Absolutely excellent. Anybody could make that. And it sounds great. It's easy. Chad, thank you hard. again for joining us on the Cooking Without Looking TV show, Mother's Day oh. edition for 2024. My pleasure. Thank you. Before we leave, I, I never do this. Uh, so before we leave, uh, remember to go to our website at www.cookingwithoutlookingtv.wordpress.com and donate on the link at the top of the page for your chance to win a Cooking Without Looking TV show apron of your very own. Um, also, it keeps us, um, it, it keeps us producing these wonderful videos and our podcasts. So we appreciate anything you send over. And thank you again, Terry Rentmeesters and Chad uh, Bartlett. And thank you all for joining us on the Cooking Without Looking TV show, Mother's Day edition 2024. If you would like today's recipes, oh, that stew sounds great, and breakfast too, <laughs> as well as past recipes, please go to our website at www.cookingwithoutlookingtv dot wordpress dot com and alan you know what if they would like to enjoy today's show or past shows please go to our cooking without looking youtube channel and guess what don't forget to like and subscribe absolutely renee you know that if people who teach students who are legally blind or, or partially sighted they can use any of our shows for their students at no charge. That's right, Alan. Many teachers around the country and 73 countries around the world now use our Cooking Without Looking TV show to teach their students. And many of them are teachers who have sighted students and they want to show how to use all of their senses um, while they're cooking in the kitchen. Absolutely. Viewers can also check out our Cooking Without Looking podcast on Spotify, iHeartRadio, or anywhere where they get their favorite podcast. We're also available on Alexa-enabled devices and Victor Reader. And Alan, if viewers today or any other day would like to donate to our Vision World Foundation to help us on our mission to change the way we see blindness, they can go to our website at www.cookingwithoutlookingtv.wordpress.com and click right at the top of the page. And for more information, please call me at 305-200-9104 if you'd like to sponsor our show. Renee, everyone can look for our next show in June. I'm Renee Rentmeester. On behalf of Alan Preston, Annette Watkins, and all of us at the Cooking Without Looking TV show and Vision World Foundation, thank you. Bye for now. Bye.